Welcome to Deeper. This is an episode on all things sex brought to you by Adam and Eve. I'm Dr. Jenny Schuyler. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and certified sex therapist. I'm also the resident sex expert for Adam and Eve. Today's 30 minute show, I have a special guest here and I am so excited to have him. This is my good friend and colleague, Dr. Craig Heacock psychiatrist extraordinaire in Fort Collins, Colorado, and we are going to have a conversation on all things related to SSRIs and sex. Because depression and anxiety are a super common thing, and a lot of people have SSRIs in their background, take them presently, and it compromises our sex drive. So we're going to get really real on what is sex drive, how do SSRIs impact it, and some alternative ideas in terms of solving this solution, or this problem. So. Without further ado, Dr. Craig Heacock, please Thanks, tell Jenny. us about you. I am an adolescent and adult psychiatrist and addiction specialist. I'm in solo private practice in Fort Collins. And um, I also have a podcast called Back from the Abyss, which is a psychiatric so. stories, people's plunge into psychiatric darkness and how they got out. That's, mm. that's been my passion project my attempt to put some balloons of hope out in the, into the world. It's an amazing podcast. And i um, very excited that you invited me down to do this. So happy to be here with you. And I also want to give, you know, there's a lot of different ways people look at psychiatry, and I know one of the things I appreciate and respect about you is that you have alternative vision on this, and Craig doesn't just give meds and say goodbye. There's a really more holistic and thoughtful, comprehensive approach to it. Do you mind speaking yeah. briefly to that? And sadly, in 2019, so many psychiatrists have moved to this sort of 10 to 12 to 15 minute med check model where they come in, ask a few symptoms and write scripts. That is not what I do. Unfortunately, there are other psychiatrists who are not doing this, but I, first of all, I trained in a residency program that deeply valued psychotherapy and I've spent many years with many different supervisors uh, doing psychotherapy, a bit of my own therapy. I'm a huge fan of therapy. I love therapy. And I do therapy with almost all my patients. Um, now some of them have another therapist they see, like a sex therapist or a trauma mm -hmm. therapist, but I'm all about psychotherapy. I mean, I really think of, if you think of sort of the treatment picture as a puzzle, I mean, for a lot of people, medications might be one piece of that puzzle, mm -hmm. but it's just a piece. And a lot of people come to me thinking like, Fix me with a med. And yeah. you know what I'm often saying is, look, like you are a garden and we need to help you uh, bloom and grow. And yeah, we're gonna maybe add some fertilizer to your soil, which could, could be a couple medications or supplements, but that, that's just the yeah. beginning. That's just, that's just a small part of what I do. Good, yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, um, I'm actually gonna lower this for a second. So, I feel like I'm a little blinded by the sun. So, Craig, one of the things I wanted to talk about on the show today was how do you define an SSRI? Let's start here. How do you define an SSRI mm -hmm. and what is it used for? Yeah. Because I think there's a misconception on what SSRIs are actually valuable for. Yeah, good, good question. So, SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. They first appeared on the market around 1990 with Prozac, fluoxetine. So this family of meds includes things like Prozac, which is fluoxetine, Zoloft, which is sertraline, Lexapro, which is escitalopram, Celexa, which is also called citalopram. These meds are often thought of as antidepressants and called antidepressants, but that is actually inaccurate. I think that's one of the great misconceptions about these meds. Mm -hmm. Now, while they can be effective for, say, postpartum depression, um, premenstrual symptoms of depression, and, and depression in certain men, in general, we should think of these meds as anxiety meds. Yeah. So SSRIs like Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, these are not antidepressants. I often get people coming to my practice, severe depression, they say, oh, I've been on four antidepressants and nothing works. And they say, oh, I've been on Lexapro and Zoloft and Paxil and Prozac. And I say, okay, so you've been on four anxiety meds, but mm -hmm. you have not actually been on a depression med. Um, so these meds are primarily effective for both what I like to call above the neck and below the neck anxiety. So above the neck anxiety would be our ruminating spin cycle, obsessional, catastrophizing what if brain. Yeah. Uh, below the neck, and so SSRIs can be very helpful for that. Also SSRIs are helpful for below the neck anxiety, which is our 
adrenaline, sympathetic, cortisol system, you know, with panic. Panic and, attacks. Yeah, yeah. So it actually, mm -hmm. SSRIs help with both. Um, and when we talk a little later about potential alternatives to SSRIs, you know, it very much matters, <clears throat> excuse me, if, if your anxiety emanates from above the neck or below the neck, whether you're going to be able to potentially either avoid SSRIs or whether SSRIs are probably in your future. Okay. So if somebody's having depression, they should not take an SSRI. Well, um, actually, you should listen. I just did a podcast on this. Uh, I know, I listened to Yeah, a few to weeks it. ago. The leading question. I, I did. I'm back from the abyss. There's a just like nine-minute little mini lecture on what's the deal with depression. And so it, the gist of that is that uh, it matters what's causing your depression. So if your depression is being primarily fueled by anxiety, SSRIs can work be great. But it's because they are working as anxiety relieving meds that then secondarily is turning down the depression. Um, but again, for, for the vast majority of t subtypes of depression, someone comes into my office with significant depressive vegetative symptoms, SSRIs, no, not on the table, unless the depression is being uh, fueled by obsessive compulsive disorder or a primary panic or a generalized anxiety, something like that, mm -hmm. above the neck or below the neck anxiety is the driving fuel of depression, then SSRIs, yeah, they're a reasonable yeah. thing. So here's what's interesting. As humans, we all have anxiety. That's what makes us human. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we wouldn't be at the top of the food chain. My opinion is we wouldn't be here, sitting here, top of the food chain, if we weren't hypervigilant, trying to make sure everything was safe. Mm -hmm. And so that creates anxiety in the system. Then you have outlying circumstances that perpetuate even higher anxiety. So there is utility to the SSRIs. So we don't want to get rid of, rid of the SSRIs necessarily, it sounds like. We just want to appropriately use them and diagnose Mm -hmm. as we use them, is mm -hmm. my understanding of that. Yeah, I think what happens all over the country millions of times a year is people come to their primary care physician with some flavor of depression, mm -hmm. and primary care docs who have a very hard job and have to do everything from you know, throat swabs to pap smears, they say, oh, we'll put you on an antidepressant, like right. Prozac or Zoloft, which again, for the vast majority of people, is not an antidepressant. Um, now that you might get lucky and find that by dialing down anxiety that that's going to help dial down their depressive symptoms too. But but depression and anxiety, I think of like peanut butter and jelly. Uh -huh. Like they go, they usually go together, yeah. but not always. And they definitely there's um, feedback mechanisms sometimes with them, but they're separate things. Yeah. So let's talk about what SSRIs do to our sex drive. And as we talk about that, I want to be really clear about what sex drive is. It's actually not a clinical term. Sex drive is composed of really three different parts. We've got desire, arousal, and orgasm. So desire is how we turn on our brain. How do we get turned on? How do we clear off the things that turn us off? Arousal is how our body gets turned on, how the electricity gets going, how blood flow gets flowing, erections go, get moving, you know, erect nipples, all the excitement in the body. And then there's orgasm, which is sort of that peak climatic moment, typically the rhythmic contraction of the genitals. So those three components, desire, arousal, and orgasm are what count, constitutes our sex drive. And I imagine the SSRIs impact one or many or all of these. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for breaking that up. Um... Maybe we could start with the third one, orgasm. I know orgasm, you're, yeah. you're not. You're all about non-goal-focused sex, right? Just yes. the process. But let's pleasure just, just right. pleasure-oriented sex. But let's just talk about but... the end because it is very true. So when I talk with people about SSRIs, I tell them, look, in general, these are very safe meds and they're very well tolerated. But there is one side effect, particularly if a woman, you are very likely to have. So depending on the study, anywhere between a third and maybe 70% of women have orgasm problems with SSRIs. What does problems mean? It could mean uh, longer time to orgasm. It could mean a diminished um, intensity of orgasm or diminished pleasure. It could be inability to multiply orgasm where they used to, mm -hmm. but just the overall ability to orgasm in a very significant percentage of women is and decreased. I, and when, when, when you say that, because we've been getting a lot of pronoun questions, you're referring to a, a person who has a biological 
body of, of a woman in terms yes. of hormone constitution yes. and vulva. Why then women, in terms of that sort of that nat- the biology of what makes a woman or a female versus a male? Why do males not struggle with orgasm with that? Yeah, or do so they? males typically have delayed, well, again, probably 40 to 60 per 70 percent of men on SSRIs will say they have delayed orgasm. Okay. And orgasmia with men is rare on these meds. Okay. Now, you would be the expert in this, Jenny. I mean, I'm thinking that the female orgasm potentially might be more complicated um, physiologically than the male. I don't know, but it does seem that there, the male orgasm is a much harder thing to shut down than the female orgasm. I mean, I have men on humongous doses of SSRIs that would pretty much totally squelch a woman's orgasm, and they orgasm fine. Okay. Um, whereas I rarely see, a, like for, for obsessive compulsive disorder, you need to be on quite high dose SSRI typically. And I tell most women, like it, it's probably gonna be very difficult to orgasm. to orgasm. Now again, usually, you know, severe OCD is one of the most miserable things you could possibly have. Mm-hmm. So the vast majority of women with that severe of OCD tell me, look, Prefer. while I would like to orgasm, yeah. to not be stuck in my house, you know, washing my hands till they bleed all day yeah. long, like that, that's a, that's a decent trade. Yeah, that makes sense. So, but let me, I'll answer the question around is, a female versus a male orgasm more complicated in a minute. I think that has to do with arousal. Um, and I can explain what I mean by that here. But why do some men then on SSRIs report not having a high, that, that their libido has gone missing? Yeah. So, um, so maybe we could step to the libido for now. We, we okay. went from orgasm. So, so, so libido <laughs> being, or their drive for sex, yeah. which is desire. Yeah. I find that to be the desire. Like my, my brain doesn't get like, activated and excited for yeah, sex. Yeah, yeah. So, so a lot of well-informed patients, in which I see a lot of those today, will ask me, okay, yeah, I've heard about the orgasm problem, but what about sex drive, libido? And that is a very complicated issue. Um, and, and let me say why. I mean, one reason, one way to think about it is that um, awesome book, um, the woman come as you are come as you are right about yeah right this idea of the sexual breaks and accelerator yeah that um it's possible that ssris could be on the accelerator or the brakes so how could ssris be on the accelerator um let's take someone who has for example terrible body image issues whether they have body dysmorphic disorder or just lots of ruminative catastrophic anxiety about their body if a person like this could get on a dose of SSRI that actually helped dial down the mm. horror of their body, okay. I've definitely talked to patients who say, oh, yeah. my <clears throat> because I feel a little better about my body image, yes. my sex drive is better. Yeah. Um, I've also had people yeah. say that, uh, in general, their anxiety is so awful 24-7 that the last thing they want to do is have sex. Because, right. And that in those cases, again, SSRIs can help libido. When did they not help? Well, um, we were just... Let me, I want to pause and just emphasize that because anxiety and sex um, don't work well together, no. right? We can't get aroused if we have anxiety. So, so I always say the first thing we need for our sex drive to begin a sexual experience is relaxation. If we're relaxed, then arousal has space to emerge. So if that relaxation can come naturally, awesome. If that relaxation needs to come from an SSRI to damp down the anxiety factor, great, right? Mm-hmm. Because if we can feel relaxed, then we can get aroused. Yeah, so those, so, so those are two examples yeah. of where SSRIs might actually help libido. Um, here's an example where they can hurt libido, and I, I hear this regularly, where, um, as the patient describes the lack of interest, um, and I, it took me a few years to figure this out, but I've started realizing I need to ask, hey, before or throughout your life, has sex been a way that you self-soothe, that you yeah. find comfort, that when you come together with your partner, yes, there's sex drive and sexual tr- attraction, but is, is it also a way that you can sort of calm your nervous system and and manage anxiety and there's a significant subset of people who say yes like i i like to have sex before i go to sleep because it's calming or sometimes i'll come home very stressed and my partner and i have sex and i feel so much better 
And there's well, the release of the dopamine. Yeah, and release the cortisol. Yeah, it's it's a it's a anxiety for some people it can be a deeply anxiety relieving thing. Well, what if for whatever reason your anxiety's here, unnecessarized, it's here, mm -hmm. and you're finding that you're just not needing your partner as much to help you soothe. Mm -hmm. You experience that as a lack of sex drive. Sex drive. Yeah. But it could well be that it's not that you want your partner less, it's that you need them less because you are not as with anxiety. This is beautiful. You don't mm -hmm. need them to self-soothe, which actually frees them from the burden of being the soothing object mm -hmm. and that sex is the mechanism for soothing and it opens up options for sex to be about intimacy and connection and skin to skin from a different place of wanting versus needing. Mm -hmm. I don't need it to soothe. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't need that glass of wine to soothe and relax. I can actually feel soothed and relaxed through other means, maybe an SSRI. And I want the glass of wine because it tastes good. Mm -hmm. I want to have sex because it feels good. So I think it's actually relearn. I think in the process of that, it's relearning what sex can be and different reasons to have sex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then another group, there, <clears throat> there's definitely a percentage of men and women who come back after being on SSRI for weeks and they say, I'm just not as interested in sex. Mm -hmm. And it's not because of the self-soothing thing or it's not because of conflict with the partner or you know, we problem solve all the things. They'll just say, you know, my libido is here, now it's here. Or libido is here. You know, and for some people, the libido yeah, can just yeah. disappear. And that's not, a, that's not a large percentage of people. I mean, I don't... Can I, can I clarify when you yeah. do their drive, their cognitive drive for sex disappear, their arousal disappears and they just can't access Cognitive it? drive. The cognitive yeah, drive. Yeah, but we'll talk about arousal in a minute because okay. that is separate, yeah. Okay. But no, there's, again, is it one in 10? It, it, this is a small number, but there's, there's definitely a not insignificant percentage of people who will say, oh, this is really helping my anxiety. Okay. But the weird thing is, I don't even think about sex. It just doesn't really cross my mind. Mm -hmm. And my partner will suggest, and I think, oh, okay. Hmm, strange. I haven't really thought about it or mm -hmm. been, you know, wanting it. That's weird. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and I don't know what that is. I mean, I do hear this, not infrequently. And for some people, again, that's a big problem. Other people will, might say, well, the anxiety relief is so significant for now it's fine and yeah you know and oftentimes I'll encourage that person to bring their partner in and explain to them hey your 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 partner was the initiator here for a long time he or she's now taking a medicine that for whatever yeah. reason has dialed that down let's just so you know it's not you it's mm -hmm. it's this medicine and that that can be greatly relieving for people to hear that oh it's a potentially a medication issue that my partner can't come or that my partner's not initiating sex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but the arousal thing, that that is, again, that's fairly mysterious, but there is, what, I mean, I don't think there's, I haven't seen any good research on this, but you know, maybe one in five people who will say, and again, these are over, um, overlapping Venn diagrams. So people are having orgasm problems, you know, libido problems and, arousal like they sometimes yeah. are the same person but there are people who say hmm on the SSRI I just I just feel like I just don't feel as much well my guess is and correct me if I'm wrong if you feel a lot of anxiety then you feel a lot of other things too you are just yeah. a person who feels the world mm -hmm. in, a, in a prominent way to include your anxiety mm -hmm. you take a med that damps down your anxiety it probably damps down all the other somatic sensations That's fair, to yeah. include arousal. Yeah, yeah. So everything just comes lower. Yeah. I mean, I, one way I think of metaphorically, I think of SSRIs as sort of a kind of a warm blanket around the nervous system, mm -hmm. just sort of, mm, mm -hmm. which can be nice, but you can imagine too, just um, neurophysiologically, that if, if that's kind of what's happening, that the whole sexual responsiveness from brain and yeah. organs and, and body and, and erogenous zones might just be dialed down yeah, a couple yeah. notches. So, yeah. um, I also talk about arousal as a sister emotion of anxiety. Because we talk about arousal in the body, the symptoms are very similar to anxiety. Mm -hmm. We get hot, you know, our heart rate gets going. You know, things get flowing. We're, we're, you know, the anxiety like this can also be the excitement like this. They're like shades mm -hmm. different, mm -hmm. but they're just like 
on different sides of the nervous system. So they're sort of sisters. Mm -hmm. So again, if, I guess if we had to summarize with these three, you know, with the libido, arousal, orgasm, orgasm far and away is, is the biggest issue yeah. for most people. For men, typically it's an orgasm delay. And for, I mean, I have men who take SSRIs specifically to, to help them with premature ejaculation. That's the only I've reason they take too. that. Yeah. So I have men who take low-dose Prozac, not because they have anxiety, not because they have anger problems, but because they, they, last can, they last longer. Yeah, just 10 or 20 Prozac, and a lot of them are really grateful for that. Uh, but with women, the orgasm problem t is tends to be more, a little more common, but also more profound in that it's, it can often be anorgasmia, great delay, or and or just very diminished intensity of orgasm. Yeah, seems like you know you asked is the is the female orgasm in terms of like the a biological body of a female um, more complicated than a male. Um, it's a really great question. I don't. I don't necessarily have an answer to that. Um, I know that arousal tends to be a little more complicated, because biological women don't have testosterone unless they're taking testosterone replacement, um, and by testosterone replacement, like a big amount to do like a sex change kind mm -hmm. of testosterone replacement. We just do as women. There isn't as much testosterone in the body as a man, and mm -hmm. so that get up gear. So I, I kind of compare it to a fire. Mm -hmm. If you have a lot of testosterone in the body. Um, biologically, then it's like a gas lighter fluid on a fire. Mm -hmm. You know, the startup yeah. mechanism is so easy mm -hmm. for women without that testosterone. You know, I hear a lot of women say, I want to want. Mm -hmm. Getting to that threshold where the fire is going, it's like two rocks sometimes mm -hmm. rubbing a fire. Now, this is not true in a new relationship where there's all that excitement, that's like lighter fluid, <laughs> or an affair, that's like lighter fluid, like all the like new, mysterious, shiny new things that are part of, you know, relationships um, or sex are like lighter fluid. But once you get into long-term um, relationship or long-term monogamy, it can feel like two rocks rubbing because we don't have the testosterone to fuel it in the same way. I don't know if that necessarily makes the orgasm more complicated or not. I know that the startup gears can be more complicated, which mm -hmm. may make the whole process more complicated and just slower and feel like I'm taking too long and then I feel guilty about it. So there can be all those cognitive distortions going on too. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you never take too long. You take as long as you <laughs> want to take, take as long as you want, use the toys, mm -hmm. make it all about pleasure, let the orgasm be that like mm -hmm. delicious end if we're always searching for it. Because I imagine you take an SSRI, the orgasm feels more elusive. The next time you have sex, you're like, am I going to orgasm this time? It must mm -hmm. be the SSRI. SSRI. I get anxious about this, even though I'm taking an SSRI and I should be anxious. But then we go into that with that self-sabotaging cognitive distortion. Oh, I'm going to take a long time. And then I'm worried about taking a long time. I take a long time. And it becomes every time you go through it, we're afraid of that. Mm -hmm. Maybe part of it. It'd be an interesting research study. Mm -hmm. Maybe the research is out there. Mm -hmm. Got to do more exploration. Um, while we have a few more minutes, Craig, I want to ask you, for people who are feeling the compromise of SSRIs on their sex drive, be it their desire, their arousal, and or their orgasm, mm -hmm. what are some other options? Yeah. So, first of all, <clears throat> you know, it matters greatly what kind of anxiety you have. Okay. So, right. let me Above just, let me, yeah, below. and and also, let so let's talk about a case where SSRIs are probably necessary. And this is probably the only case that I can think of where they're almost always necessary, and that's with obsessive compulsive disorder. So if you have you know, disabling, life-changing, um, misery-inducing obsessive compulsive disorder, okay. there's just not much else that we have to offer. There are some antipsychotics that can help. There's some new protocols with transcranial magnetic stimulation where they put pulsing magnets on your brain that might help. There are a couple different uh, brain surgeries that can help, but but really for people with OCD, SSRIs are the thing. Okay. So good so to what, know you have it out there, right? Yeah. So when I that's hard, um, but for all other types of anxiety, there are usually other options. Okay. So let's talk below the neck anxiety. So for people whose anxiety primarily starts with adrenaline and panic, panic and chest tightness and, and gut stuff, stuff the um, there's a lot because 
what we're looking at doing there is trying to dial down the nervous system. So what could work? Lots of things can work. My favorite thing is to recommend aerobic exercise, but not just aerobic exercise, but intervals, or what are also called Tabatas. There's very interesting research that uh, aerobic exercise squashes panic. And let me just tell this interesting example. There's been a couple studies where they inject people with chemicals that cause panic attacks. They run them on a treadmill, or at least get them up to their anaerobic threshold on a treadmill for a few minutes. They re-inject them, no panic. Wow. Yeah. All right, so, if you're not exercising. Yeah, it's almost, it's not impossible, but it's extremely rare for people to have panic attacks, which is, you know, the full-blown manifestation of, you know, below-the-neck anxiety, mm -hmm. if you work out aerobically. And what's so interesting, what you just said is Tabata, and I do this with some of my clients in my mm -hmm. office in terms of discharging the anxiety through movement or pressure, but a Tabata is a four-minute experience, 20 seconds of intensity, 10 seconds rest for four minutes and you feel maxed out at the end of that. So you could do mm -hmm. jumping lunges, push-ups, something yeah. stressful and hard for you, whatever yeah. your capacity is and do 20 on 10 off for yeah. four minutes. And that seems like that would achieve what you're talking about. Yeah. Like when I, years ago when I had to do my, um, my oral, uh, board exams for psychiatry, incredibly stressful thing. It's offered twice a year. At least at that point, it was $4,000. You had to fly to Pittsburgh. You had to walk into a room with a, a psychiatric patient and three attendings who were staring at you, and you had to do a 30-minute uh, rapid psychiatric evaluation and a 30-minute case presentation with them grilling you, and it had a 65% fail rate. And then if you miss it, you have to wait a year to do it again. So people freak out. In fact, they no longer do it anymore because so many people failed it. They now have a much easier board certification. But what I did before this was I did intervals. So I was in my Pittsburgh like Motel 8 or whatever, and I got the treadmill, and I was running 45 seconds until I practically collapsed slow. And I did probably 10 intervals, put on my suit, got on the bus, and I was strangely calm. And That's... I, I know. A couple Amazing. people asked me, they, a couple people said, are you on beta blockers? Like, you seem like you're fine. I said, no, I just did a really hard workout at my, at my uh, motel. And they said, oh, does that help? I said, that helps. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's an amazing nugget of gold. Yeah. Another thing, way to address uh, bl pr primarily below the neck uh, anxiety with non-pharmacologically is what's called biofeedback. And I've done biofeedback and a huge proponent. So basically what biofeedback is, it's computer-assisted sympathetic nervous system training. So all it is, it's actually pretty simple. You get hooked up to a blood pressure monitor, a heart rate monitor, and a skin conductivity monitor, usually on your hand. Okay. Um, and then a computer screen. And you learn how to control your blood pressure, your heart rate, and your skin conductivity, which is really just a measure of how much peripheral blood flow, because when you when your fight flight's turned on, your blood shunts from your periphery to the core and your hands get cold and clammy. So the skin conductivity meter is really a measure of how well you're perfusing your periphery. So what you learn in biofeedback mm -hmm. is you learn to, with your conscious brain, to dial down your sympathetic nervous system, okay. which is a super cool trick. And people don't believe it at first because they think, oh, my fight flight, that, that's, a, that's out of my control. No. Right, you control your fight flight you, and learn these tools can, to control your nervous you system. You can totally learn to control. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I was on a plane, with my family, I was on a plane um, in the Colombian Andes a few years ago. We had this little plane and the, the air wasn't working well and it started getting really hot and suffocating in this little plane. And I, I've had panic attacks before. I started having a panic attack. So I started doing my biofeedback training, which is a specific kind of, uh, one thing you start with is one, um, you do six breaths per minute, one breath every 10 seconds in the cycling. And my oldest daughter was starting to have a panic attack. So I held under her hands and I said, breathe with me. And so she she did the whole breath cycle with me, and we totally mm -hmm. calmed ourselves down. Um, the human brain's amazing. So what if you have anxiety from the neck up? Yeah. Then you need to do Sam Harris's meditation course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or, um, no, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about, uh, you know, meditation's a hot topic now. Why should you meditate? You know, as Sam Harris says, 
you should meditate so you can be less miserable. Okay. Because what meditation really teaches you is that your attention is under your control. Mm -hmm. That um, you are not a victim of your uh, monkey mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so much of above the neck anxiety starts with what, what many people would argue is our superpower as humans. You know, we have this ability to imagine, you know, what does a DNA molecule look like? How would we get people to Mars? You know, what are the different ways that the immune system could fight off a virus? And we, you know, or is my wife having an affair? Where are all the places she could she could be right now? So if you ruminate, because it sounds like there's different, yeah, the, you know your anxiety is in the body if you can feel it. Yeah. Or you know your anxiety is in the head if you just ruminate over the yeah. same thing over and over. Yeah, and no, you can't escape that monkey mind. Yeah, because ab above the neck and below the neck, they, they feed off each other. Because a lot of people of say, I have both. But if you're very mindful, it always starts one place. Yeah, so, mine's below the neck. But again, if you do mindfulness training or meditation training, you can learn to change the way you think and to change the way you feel about what you think. Yeah. So, I mean, SSRI is going to help that too, but you know, mindfulness training, meditation training is a way to get hold of your really misery-making brain yeah. and, and do that without drugs. And just to end there with that, mindfulness for the brain in terms of meditation is so good for sex too. So having mindfulness apply to your sex, because again, there's that connection. If you're really mindful about your thoughts, you're mindful about I'm here in this moment. Let me tune into my sensations, tune into my arousal, tune into what's I'm, what I'm experiencing. Oh, you know what? I notice myself in the corner. I'm watching myself have sex and I'm judging myself. I can get out of the corner. Let me come back into my body. All those mindfulness pieces of being aware of your body, your witness, all those pieces can mm -hmm. actually make sex way better too. Any other last thoughts, Greg? No, this has been really fun. This I've been enjoyed super this, fun. yeah. I feel like there's a lot of other things we could talk about, but it seems like that's enough to chew on for the moment. Part two. We'll do part two <laughs> another time. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions, please ask us. I see a lot of questions here, but we're out of time. So our team will answer questions behind the scenes. And if you have any ideas in terms of episodes you want to hear, um, please give us suggestions because we can address all your topics. Thank you so much. Catch us on Savvy Sex in 60 Seconds. About once a week, we have a... 60 to 90 second episode. Maybe if I take more Prozac, it'll be 90 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Not or just maybe 60 you just seconds. won't even want to do it. Be like, yeah, I can, I can make the video or, I so, <laughs> or I could just sit here. <laughs> <laughs> just sit here. All right. Thanks so much. We are here because of you and we will catch you next time in February, which is Valentine's month and uh, pros and cons to that. We do it untraditionally. So catch us then. Bye. Oh, that was so fun.